My name is uh, Peter Oreo. I'm a radiation oncologist, so maybe a lot of you don't know me. Uh, Oreo, like the cookie, pronounced that way, so don't be shy to say it. It was a traumatic childhood. I'm mostly okay now, I, I think. Um, right on, get uh, Dana Faber. I'm vice chair of the department as well. These are my disclosures. Oops. There they are. All right, what do you see? Some of you see a couple looking across the water. Maybe it's an ocean, river, lake. Maybe they're thinking about starting a family. Maybe they're thinking about a baby. And maybe you all see the baby kind of hidden in these trees. My point here is we see what we want to see because of our experiences, our training, what we do for a living. So we can interpret the same set of data differently. And it's not wrong that we do that. It's just intrinsic to what, how the human mind is. So let's see what I see. You may not see what I see, but let's see what we do. It's a one slide presentation, okay? All right, the wild, wild west. We are 800 miles due north of Tombstone where the gunfire of the OK Corral happened. Let's just take a moment though to admire those mustaches. I was trying to grow that mustache for this conference, and I think it's going to take years, so this is it. I even smiled up with a little wax this morning. What's happening in our profession is we are in a gunfight. Radiation oncology is taking aim at brachytherapy because they have more lucrative technologies to offer. But prostate brachytherapy is something that both the urologists and the radiation oncologists enjoy together. We have reimbursement codes. We can do it well, we know it's efficacious, it's efficient, it's convenient, and it's the right thing to do for patients. Radiation Oncology Linux are multi-million dollar pieces of equipment. They're trying to mimic what a handful of seeds, which cost maybe a couple hundred dollars, do. That's kind of unfair. So the update on Radiation Oncology is we're just using that Linux and we're naming it diff treatments different names. SBRT, Saber, Hypofractionation, Ultra hyperfractionation. We're going to confuse you. But we're doing the same thing with just more image guidance. But the issue is we cannot get enough dose in from the outside in because dose matters. Dose matters. I need to give cancer a lot of radiation to make it go away. But if something is prohibiting me from doing it, like the normal tissues around the prostate, well, that's problematic. Treating from the outside in is difficult. The cancers with higher risk, and low risk cancers do fine with all these technologies. But when we're using brachytherapy, we're treating from the inside out. So we can give these big doses of radiation which are gonna affect cell kill and kill the cancer. To put this into perspective, there's some randomized trials I'd like to talk about, one that Mira talked about yesterday. But one is the flame trial. That's my little candle down here. So the FAME trial was basically treating the prostate to curative dosing as we understand it for what we can give from the outside in. But giving more dose to the dominant nodule because again, those who do beam understand dose matters, but you still are constrained by the normal tissues around it. So you can only get so much in. But the ultimate show, uh, uh, the ultimate you know, sort of demonstration that dose and dose escalation is beneficial is essentially the ASCEND RT trial. And Mary did a wonderful job you know, discussing this last, yesterday. But essentially, it was dose escalated radiation compared to uh, radiation with a prostate brachytherapy boost. At nine years, the biochemical free survival was 20% improved. That's a lot. If that was a drug, you just made a billion dollars. It does both for the Phoenix definition of Nader plus two, because obviously these definitions can push PSA survival into the future. But they also looked at the surgical definition, as Mara showed yesterday, you know, 0.2. And again, as she mentioned, you could drive a truck through those curves. <clears throat> but you see what you want to see. I see a huge benefit. At Harvard, on our pathways, if you have higher risk disease, you're getting a brachytherapy boost. That's just what it is. The issue is at other institutions, depending on who you see, is going to be, depend on what you're going to be treated with. I think that's problematic because we're really not looking at the literature. However, the naysayers are gonna say, well, you know, there's a lot of toxicity. There was more catheterization and strictures. Well, that is true. But it was kind of funny how they were looking at that. A catheter which was temporary, is that really a toxicity? By definition, every time you all do a prostatectomy, you've caused a grade three toxicity, but I don't believe that. The strictures are real though. 
But that was really technique related because they were dragging the seeds down past the prostate into the GE diaphragm. You know, if you get the external sphincter, you have a higher probability of having a stricture. It doesn't mean you're going to, but if you put seeds there, it's problematic. I think Pete Rossi did a wonderful job yesterday showing how he's integrating MRIs into treatment planning so we can actually see what we want to see because we contour what we see and that's what we give dose to. But if we contour the wrong damn thing, you're giving dose to the wrong damn thing. So I do a simple trick in the OR. I look at MRIs and all that just like everybody else, but I really want to define my apex. So on sagittal imaging, <clears throat> I do a sweep. You can kind of see the torpedo shape of the prostate. But simply, and this came out of necessity, one day I was in the OR trying to explain to our resident where the apex was. He was struggling. So I called to the scrub nurse, get me a needle. She came tentatively giving it to me. I think she thought I was going to stab him, which obviously <laughs> I wouldn't do. But I simply impl implanted it, showed the prostate wiggle, and said, there's your apex. Well, I've been doing that since, and it actually decreases toxicity because now I know where to stop my contours. Mm -hmm. Kind of a poor man's way. Next time they want to try it, it really works well. So basically, you have to pay attention to your anatomy because that's the way we're going to get rid of our toxicities. Others who see what they want to see are going to say, well, there's no overall, overall survival benefit. We can salvage these patients. Well, the treatment was not, the study wasn't powered for overall survival. And I will scream from the top of that mountain or any mountain out here and stop say, saying, our first chance of cure is the best chance of cure. Cure for patients. We can do it. With prostatectomies, with brachytherapy, we can cure patients. Why allow them to have toxic quality of life reducing therapies to take away their testosterone and their dignity instead of just curing them right the first time? There's not a single man in this room who would choose salvage hormonal therapy versus the cure the first time. And so why are we allowing that to happen? It's hypocritical. Take my gun outside shooting too. The other thing we have to pay attention to is our specialties. You know, there used to be these turf wars between radiation oncology and urology, but I really think we're getting along a hell of a lot better because we have so many different toys to play with and there's so much prostate cancer to treat. We can't do it all. Now, we can interpret various things and in saying my technique might be better than your technique, but the reality is they all work. But what's happening? Well, medical oncology is starting to take over injury and deprivation therapy. They're prescribing all the my Azutamides, and azutamides, all the mites, all the shizaminabs, I mean, all of it. In Boston, we don't touch any of it. Medonc does it all. That to me is somewhat problematic because we're the ones who have the way to cure prostate cancer, the radical prostatectomies, high food, cryo, brachy, beam, you name it, we cure. We don't wait for someone that needs salvage therapies. My fear, if we allow this to be taken over by others, is we're going to be with PSMA PET scanning and everything else coming, we're going to start to find oligomastic disease, small volume, which we know we can cure with definitive treatments. But these patients may not get them. They're going to be put on hormones. They're going to get the receptor blockers, the inhibitors. But what did we really do? We've got to keep things in our wheelhouse. We've got to you know, kind of hold the line. Because if we don't, it's going to be taken away. And if it's taken away, we don't control it. And if we don't control it, we don't guide it. And that's a problem, because we're the ones to do it. Well, I just switch gears to rectal spacing. I've been involved with this with uh, Agmenix, with, spa uh, with Space OAR, and now with Barrage. I think this is going to define my generation as a radiation oncologist. Generation before is all image guidance. Yeah, you can see what we treat nowadays. But rectal spacing, I think, is incredibly important because it's going to allow dose escalation because if dose matters, the rectum is the organ at risk, which is problematic. So push it away. Simple. We've got two tools now, one about to be FDA approved, one that's FDA approved. Now, the spacer stuff, there's a little bad press over the past couple of days because Boston Scientific had to release a statement saying, you know, this can go into the veins and, you know, embolize, and we've got three people in the ICU. You know, you have to do a hydrogen section, goes in as a liquid. It's simple fluid dynamics. It's going to go where it chooses to go. And so I do a lot of them, but they're not always perfect. Now, Barra Gel, I think, is of interest, and I think it's just an innovation in kind of an iterative project, product. Where it goes in as a gel, you can see on the ultrasound, it has good lift. As you're putting it down, you can see it. Because you can see it, you know what you're spacing. This doesn't polymerize. There's no time constraints. So basically, before you leave the OR, you can see that it went where it was supposed to go. 
And if the seminal vesicles are in your target, you can space that out as well. So, you know, something to consider. So in summary, we all become patients. We all become patients. Every single one of us, like it or not, we all become patients. Let's pray to God the person we're looking across the, the exam table at has our best interests in mind. Does the thing that might be a little harder to do. Because we're going to want it. I guarantee you that. So I ask you, the urologist in the room, to ask your radiation oncologist, why not? Are you not doing brachytherapy for your patients? Remind them, ask why they should. If they need help, come see me, Pete, Mira. ABS will help train. I ask you to consider putting in rectal spacers. I'm a realist. I know not everyone's getting breaky. There's just not enough, uh, enough of us who can do it. Most people are going to get beam. But let's push that rectum away so we have a chance of dose escalating. So we can actually give enough dose to cure these tumors. So we prevent patients from having to have salvage quality of life reducing toxicities. So let's maximize our cures. Let's do the right things for patients. And as other specialties start to encroach upon us, let's hold the line. Thank you.